Yes, black lives do matter. A good evening and welcome back. We now take you through your sports on the full view. In our view, to bring human faces to the Black Lives Matter conversation, we as a broadcaster will be engaging many sports personalities in order to be better informed about their experiences so that we can also help educate you as our viewer. So tonight, we have the first player of color to play for the Proteas post-isolation joining us through Skype. Um, and he's very well-traveled and well-versed. We have Mr. Mr. Omar Henry on the line. Good evening, sir, and welcome to Sports on the Full View. Good evening, Maria, and how are you? I'm very well, thank you for asking. So, Mr. Henry, you come from the wine region of Stellenbosch, and as things would unfold, your vintage years coincided with the back end of the apartheid era. Tell us more about growing up and playing cricket in a country with extreme racial divides in the 70s and the 80s. Well, a place like Stellenbosch, I think, you know, it was basically a rugby place and that's not a secret. You know, Stellenbosch University produced some of the best rugby players uh, during the apartheid years and possibly still today. Um, so sport really dominated my life, even during the apartheid years. But, uh, you know, so was politics, um, living in a non-white area um, with lots of restrictions and boards that telling you you can't go there or you're not welcome there. Um, so you, you try to accommodate all those restrictions and oppression and, and still ha live a happy life. And I think sport provided that to me. Now, Mr. Omar, would you say you were resilient in wanting to pursue cricket because it provided, as you said, for you that comfort and, and that place because maybe someone else would have said, maybe this isn't for me, let me give up on this. Well, it all started with, you know, brought up in a very poor family, but a sporting family. Um, you know, my parents played sport. Um, my brothers and sisters, uh, my uncles, uh, the people in the road that I loved, uh, we just all love sport and growing up like that, you know, um, I just love sport. I played all the sports. I played rugby, cricket, soccer, uh, tennis, table tennis, um, you name it. Um, and then found at a very young age that I, I would play cricket 12 months of the year. You know, um, I played test cricket on a on a netball field that had no grass, just gravel, and we will play five days. You know, two teams that we make up. True passion driven right there. Now let's fast forward a little bit into your career. Now in your mid twenties, you left your country of birth and you went to play in Scotland. Tell us how that came about and also tell us about your experience playing for the Scottish national team, which you appeared for 62 times between 1981 and 1992. Well, if you, if you know my history, um, it was very turbulent um, and challenging. Um, you know, I had many obstacles in my way. Uh, I've got a long history with um, clashes with the hierarchy, um, whether it is an executives or chairman of a club or chairman of a board, you know, I was always in the middle. So those things sort of um, shaped me in a way that my passion and my love for the game, I was never going to compromise that. Um, so I, I always challenged. And therefore, um, in 75, or just before 75, I was possibly 14, 15. That was during the time Basil de Oliveira was banned. Um, it wasn't picked by England. I mean, it was picked by England. And then South Africa didn't want to let that tour take place and he came out and to my school um, and I played for the school team who competed in the club team in, in the club competition the local Stellenbosch club competition and uh, as a 15 year old I played in the first team and 
it was the first time I had a coaching session by a professional cricketer. And uh, he planted the seed with my parents because they attended the function afterwards. And uh, they came home and basically said to me, we're not letting you go to England. And I said, but what are you talking about? And, uh, and it was only the next day at school that I found out that Basil de Oliveira sort of asked whether he could take me to England as a 15-year-old. And my parents just said categorically, no chance. So the, the seed was planted in my head. And when I left school, I did a, a, tra a joinery trade and I qualified. And immediately after that, when the first opportunity came, um, I left um, for England for three months to do a trial. I must say the trial didn't go that well for various reasons. A, when I arrived in England, it was raining every second day. Um, and it's supposed to be summer. England weather. So, so the weather was terrible. Um, you know, you play under very challenging conditions. It's cold, it's muddy. Um, I possibly showed what I can do in one game um, out of the games I played over that three months and uh, I came home with nothing in my hand so there was a lot of uncertainty and then February the following year during our cricket season um, the captain of the club phoned me now he must have seen something so he promised me a deal where he covers all my expenses, I work for him during the week, I play, and he paid me a salary for six months. And I, I, I just couldn't say no to that. Um, and I think that changed my entire cricket career in terms of becoming a professional. Because I, I played for that club and I think the captain was hungry for success. And they haven't won anything for 25 years. And to cut the long story short, by the end of that season, um, I've scored the most runs in the season. Um, we won the league after 25 years and uh, that put me on the right path. That is such an inspirational story. Something else I would like to discuss with you is how you were also part of the team when South Africa was invited to the first World Cup post-isolation and that 1992 version took um, place in Australia. How was that experience for you? It must have been an interesting one. Well, it was, it was a mixture of excitement and disappointment. Um, and it sort of it sort of even opened my eyes up in what to expect. Um, although I retired um, in 1993 after playing two test matches, um, but I was very concerned of what happened to me during that World Cup. And just to give you a background of it, I knew that on that tour as a spinner, I wasn't going to play a lot of games. Um, so I was very aware of that and I made peace with that. Um, but at that time I played possibly, I reckon, over a hundred first class games. And I've taken, I think at that time, over 400 wickets. So I was basically a settled professional um, and an accomplished cricketer. And yet I found that when we played on a turning pitch, I wasn't selected. Yeah. And in my nature, like I said to you, I will always ask, I needed answers. And possibly up till today, I never got an answer. Uh, Mr. O, so, uh, Mr. Omar, as you say that about just never getting answers, we are uh, short and uh, running out of time. So I just want to get to where we are currently now as a country. You've gone from a place where you probably thought you'd never play for the national team. And now you're seeing a future where um, players of colour have a place in South African cricket. But did you ever imagine in 1992 that in 2020 we'd be sitting in this position where we're still struggling with transformation in the sport and um, players of colours really don't feel like they belong 
Well, if I can, if I can tell you the honest, my honest um, experience was that I wanted to come home. I didn't want to carry on on that tour. I was very unhappy because I felt that if I, if I'm not going to take a stance, what is happening today, that was what I expected. And I was basically influenced and overruled by the hierarchy to stay because, and the reason they gave me was I was going to ruin it for the kids that coming after me. And I said, no, no, no. I, I didn't believe that. So what, what I believed then, it's happening still today. And it comes in different forms, very different forms. People use the quota, they use the target, um, they branded the players. Um, you, you know, it comes in various forms and why you are not playing. So today we still see it. And, and to be quite honest with you, I am not surprised, but I'm very disappointed in our leadership. Our leadership was supposed to drive transformation as one of the main pillars. I cannot take you 20 years yeah. to struggle with the same issues. That is 100%. I also just want to ask you, it's, it's a bit worrying as you speak about leadership that a coach like Mark Boucher has been quiet when all these important conversations are taking place. And we also understand that there was a meeting with Cricket South Africa about a week ago, as well as former players, just to try, trying to address these issues around transformation. But the director of cricket wasn't there, the CEO of cricket wasn't there. So what impression does that give you um, on, on where CSA is on this issue? Well, I don't know where they are on the issue, but Cricket SA apologized, um, and, 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 and that's fine for me. I, I can move on. But the players, the players and myself, I believe if you've got an issue, you face it face to face and you sort it out. And if you can agree on things and move on, then that is what you're doing. But at the end of the day, the players want that face-to-face -face meeting. And I, I, I firmly believe that a face-to-face -face meeting with the entire board about all the predicaments. Racism is one thing. It's only one issue why we struggle with transformation. There is a list of things. Why people uh, of color, oppressed people, are still battling and I can, I'll give you one example I'll give you one example the broadest aspect or the broadest level of participation is KFC mini cricket my question to cricket South Africa is how many government primary schools and high schools are playing cricket how many I can possibly count on my one hand yeah if I go to the province by, by province. So fundamentally, we're already behind when we start playing cricket, our kids. And you keep chasing something right up those who got talent and aspire to play for South Africa. You keep chasing a race that you have to run further than the other one. So true, so true, uh, Mr. H um, Omar Henry. Thank you so much for your time. We have unfortunately run out of time, but we hope that this discussion that we've had here today will open more conversations and lead to action being taken within cricket in South Africa. Thank you, sir. Well, there we have it, Mr.